Buonasera e benvenuti a Giovedì Scienza, primo appunto. Good evening and welcome to Giovedì Scienza Science on a Thursday, the first appointment of the new year, the first one after the holidays. During the holidays, many of us may have eaten or had too much to drink, and this evening we'll be talking about food, but not so much about diets, which maybe we should have, but of the cooking of the processes that we have uh, in preparing uh, the food. But before introducing this evening's guests, we're going to have a new scientific news of the week, uh, and it's Piero Bianucci's comment. Good evening. Good evening to you all. Right, have I got the red? Yes, I've got the red one. Caro Piero. Dear Piero. Che cosa si ha riservato la scienza questa settimana? What uh, have you got to tell us about this week? A lot of interesting things, but I'm going to choose two because it's local and one which is slightly more complex, but it's not local, but very one. I should not have uh, asked, uh, what have you cooked for us this evening? Well, I would like to draw everybody's attention uh, to uh, this uh, uh, tie, which is uh, slightly more complex uh, than uh, the ones I usually wear. It's got the periodic table. I put it uh, on the half uh, because is the person who's going to be talking, the speaker this evening, is a biochemist and is going to be re describing the biochemistry of uh, food, but it's a special one uh, for another reason, because uh, uh, this is a present of Livio Berruti, so the Olympian, uh, who won the 200 meters in 1960. But he was, well, is, because uh, he's still alive, a chemist, although he never worked as a chemist. Uh, he was uh, an extraordinary sportsman and then worked in communication, just like we're doing here. Livio Berruti, is the person who gave me uh, this tie, and I'm wearing it here, to honor Dario Bressanini. But news, news. The first news is local. We've discovered a new planet, the second around Proxima Centauri. It's uh, the closest uh, star to our solar system. It's 4.3 light years. Some people say 4.28. It's a uh, closer than Alpha Centauri, which is 4.5 or 4.6, but it is a part of the Alpha Centauri system. While it's very uh, luminous, Proxima Centauri can't be seen. You need a telescope. Uh, but they found a planet uh, in 2016, and it is the planet which is uh, closest outside the solar system. Now they found another one. And Mario Damaso, who is a, is a local person and works at the observatory here in Pino Torinese. And he did it with another researcher. He discovered it, who's not Italian. But the interesting thing is that, that this news had already filtered a year ago, but it wasn't sure. Now it's become official. And it's on the online version of Nature. This planet uh, was discovered uh, by observing for 17 years of slight variations. It's probably it's iced because Proxima Centauri is a red, very weak star. So the closest planet might have uh, liquid and iced water. This is definitely iced water. The other news item brings us uh, quite close to this evening's topic uh, because we'll be talking about food. I see you're holding a book which talks about uh, vegetables, the science of vegetables. Uh, no, I wasn't supposed to say that. Well, next time, uh, uh, we but we will cut it off. We will edit it uh, for the web version. And we have the Internet of Plants, the Internet of Agriculture. In that, plants are the users of this Internet. The curious thing is that for the first time, a company, a startup, which is now quite big, about 50 people, which is called Plant E, it's a Dutch, managed to connect a plant 
via satellite with a transmitter and with sensors that transmit data referred to the plant without using energy other than the energy that the plant uses. The plant creates or generates the energy to enter the network and all the other plants can enter or plants from other crops too, which means that through the satellite we will know how these plants are, if they need, for instance, to be watered more or less, if there are parasites that are damaging them, if the agricultural yield, the crops are as expected, and the field are about to become fields where each living being, each plant interacts with the others and tells us what they're doing. How does it work? And with this I will finish uh, that uh, what they have discovered or applied, because we knew it uh, to this, well, that this company, this Dutch company, is that the first uh, damp uh, layer of the soil uh, works as a cathode of a battery and uh, the lower part where you have the roots and the bacteria that uh, use or feed on the products of the plant and in fact of uh, their roots, uh, these uh, are the anode. The, in other words, we have a battery uh, which uh, runs through the plant itself between the top soil, the damp one, and the area around uh, the uh, roots uh, that release ions, atoms that have lost electrons, which can close a circuit. It's a vertical circuit which gives uh, the riser to electric uh, power, telling us how the plant is. It's a small transmitter which links all these uh, with the satellite. Uh, so from now on, farmers uh, will be very different if this thing develops, and it will, uh, if it takes, if it develops, we, ex agriculture will be extraordinary. Batteries for batteries. Right, I would now say that without any further ado, we should move on and introduce our guest, a chemist. He spent a year in Berkeley during his PhD, and this is a very important uh, detail. He's good, but he's also a very good uh, disseminator. He teaches at the university in Como. Is he good? Well, we'll see. And he has a YouTube channel that is greatly followed. He has a blog on science and an Instagram profile that is very successful. Dario Bressanini. Dario Bressanini. Here we are. Ciao, Alberto. Eccoci qua. Non vado a insegnare così di solito. No, no, no. I don't usually go to lectures like this. I could. Uh, this is uh, my costume. I'm a chemist. Non si riesce a inquadrare, magari, sì. Questo è il mio questo è il mio camice da chimico, perché ogni tanto This is uh, my coat as a chemist, my white coat. Uh, and they say, I'm not a doctor, our coats are thicker and different, but I've put the shadow logo, you know that there was um, a shadow organization with Commander Strecker fighting aliens, uh, and I liked it. But at the end of the 60s, uh, I wasn't born, and uh, Piero and I were, and uh, Lieutenant Ellis, Lieutenant Ellis, I think it was, I can't remember. In any case, that's shadow. Che cosa c'entra la chimica con la cucina? But what's chemistry got to do with cooking? Well, cooking is chemistry. Every time we cook something or follow a recipe or cook pasta, whatever, we are leading to a number of uh, physical and chemical reactions, whether we know it or not. Gualtiero Marchesi used to say that cooking is unaware chemistry and uh, cooks have to be art. I am in the first section, that is to say, 
helping people understand what happens uh, when we cook, uh, when we roast uh, banya cauda, which is a Piedmontese dish, uh, or uh, pasta, whatever. I'm not a chef, uh, and in my books uh, there are also uh, recipes, but um, the main message uh, I would like to convey is uh, that chemistry is everywhere, and especially in food. So the dishes uh, is an experiment. Uh, and if you, you write this, uh, which for the time being, this is the latest uh, of the many books, the trilogy uh, to science in the kitchen. I said that Berkeley is very important in your life because you studied chemistry, the chemistry of cooking there. No, no, non proprio, no. non proprio. No. Not exactly. I am a theoretical chemist, physicist, and uh, those, that's my field. But while I was in Berkeley preparing my PhD, it was the first time I was uh, away from my mother or grandmother who uh, were cooking for me. I didn't want to eat at the local cafeteria because uh, it was uh, really disgusting. And uh, my mother used to send me by, there wasn't email in those days, so she used to send me recipes. Uh, and I began to follow the recipes. Initially, it was a disaster because uh, I don't know, it was polenta or roast uh, rabbit or whatever. And at a certain point, I started wondering why does it say here that you have to cook it on a very low fire, on a very high fire, or with wine? And so I tried to understand the chemistry underlying that, uh, and I saw kitchen on cooking as a, a chemistry lab. And I used to share them in the department too. And when the experiments um, failed, uh, you certainly referred or went back to quantum mechanics, but it's not like Schroeder's cat that is sometimes alive or sometimes dead. But you must decide whether you're going to cook uh, uh, the rabbit or not. But if I use a thermometer, it'll work. Because you're saying that recipes usually say what, uh, what ingredients. Uh, they tell us uh, how much uh, of each ingredient. Uh, for example, they might say put what is necessary, how, but they rarely say why. Yes, and the why is important because most of the recipes, except for the ones uh, that have been invented in the past few years, are uh, uh, recipes that are the result uh, of uh, built up knowledge over time. Uh, millions of cooks uh, right from uh, the beginning, ever since uh, humans discovered fire. So, up until science and chemistry and modern chemistry appeared, we lacked uh, the cultural and scientific means to understand what was happening. Now, there are reactions uh, that are very difficult to replicate in the lab. For example, in the chemistry lab, we have, uh, well, they're called uh, recipes uh, too, but we work with pure substance, very few substances uh, at a controlled temperature. So from a chemical point of view, pastry is very similar because pastry uses very few ingredients, pure or very stable. For example, saccharose or sugar is a uh, pure 99% point nine percent of the white of the egg is the same so protein and water so you could analyze pastry and it's closer to chemistry but if I have to try and develop a model of the Barolo uh, donkey stew, it's very difficult to do, so you have to put uh, things together, studies. Uh, I'm, for example, if you go and see what the effect of wine, you don't use the uh, Barolo on the whole, uh, to marinate meat, or then I could go on to see what happens with the spices, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, we try and understand and create or write a scientific recipe. 
At one time, I studied this in a book that was called Invisible Machines. Una volta mi sono un po' occupato di queste cose in un libro che era era le macchine invisibili. And it was science in three rooms in a kitchen, and I had found a model of. a pork that an engineer had recreated as a, a cylinder with four small cylinder and a very thin, it was a model. It was a model of a pig for the chemist physicist who would be cooking it into pork. There were no spices because that would have become too complex for the experiment. But the thermometer, the internal temperature, was something they have these uh, probes, these thermal probes so that are very long and can measure temperature inside. So they want a certain temperature inside, maybe in another one outside for a piece of meat or whatever they were cooking. Well, this model made it possible uh, to f- forecast temperature knowing, uh, for example, that it was uh, a pork rather than platinum. Bella, questa è proprio bella. Pensava in un effetto... No, no, è bella, è bella. Questa poi la tagliamo sempre sulla versione <ride> online. E, um, io darei la parola a, a Dario Bressanini. But I would now like to give Dario Bressanini the floor and I will ask him to speak. And this book is not only here to say that, uh, uh, say that he's written it, it's on sale, but also because we will be using it practically. Right. I, will, I usually speak standing because I teach here. I am with my white coat. Those of you who follow me on YouTube know that I wear it, especially when I have to carry experiments now. Here you have uh, the three books uh, that I published. Uh, Uh, science in the kitchen, pastry, meat, uh, and the third, which has just been released to vegetables. Now, on the whole, there are are 700 pages, uh, and I will be also treating pulses, pastry and so forth. So this is not a conference uh, where I give you recipes, or devoted to a single topic, what I would like to take advantage of the subjects I've dealt with in these three books to show you that uh, why is uh, the why is cooking chemistry, and why can this uh, be useful in everyday cooking without being chemist. And then I would like to show you or discuss how a chemist or a scientist can address the issues of cooking, possibly to modify recipes or to reinvent new ones, which over the past 10 years in the world, there have been a certain number of cooperation amongst chemists, uh, chefs, and uh, other scientists. I'm going to start with something which might appear to be very obvious, and it is because it's a saucepan, a saucepan to cook pasta. And this uh, is the example which I decided to use to show you how a kitchen can be seen as a chemistry lab. It's essential for a scientist uh, to be curious, uh, to look at things, uh, even though a certain phenomenon uh, will be there and will say something you've seen for many years. At one point, you have to ask yourself questions. Uh, A scientist is someone who asks questions. This is an example of something that we know. We see it day after day. We take a saucepan. We fill it with water. We put it on the gas, and you see that There are droplets, uh, water droplets uh, that form. You must have noticed it. Many of you must have. And some of you might have wondered uh, why. This is the essential thing, asking yourself why. Because at that point, 
we have experiments, we can observe the phenomenon, and you see that if I take a saucepan and leave it there, but until I light uh, the fire, I have no droplets. So I switch the gas on, and within a second or two, we have these little droplets forming. The answer is very simple. And that is in gas combustion, it's methane in this case. We have water and carbon dioxide, and with the contact with the cold surface of the metal, which is cooled down by uh, the water inside, you for have droplets. This is an example of something that we know, we had observed probably day after day, but uh, at a certain point, if you heat, and I'm sure that some of you will have noticed, that inside, when water hasn't boiled, in fact, we're very far away from the 100 degrees, probably 40 degrees or little more, little tiny bubbles uh, are generated inside. Now, this is something you might have noticed. You might have asked yourselves why. And this is the type of attitude I would like to convey, is the why question. Uh, studying and going to see scientific publications, you will answer this. Uh, it could be steam, but you touch the water and you say, no, it's not. It can't be. Boiling water, these uh, bubbles uh, stay at the bottom and then some uh, separate and rise. Um, the air, the gas, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, CO2, and when we warm the water, they can no longer be in the water and they switch or they, be, they go back to the gaseous phase and when we reach 50, 60, more and more of these bubbles form. This is useless in terms of cooking, but it is important if you want to produce, for example, completely transparent ice, the one which you only find in a cocktail bar. It's essential because ice, when we put it in the freezer is an opaque, it's not beautiful and transparent uh, like the one you have in a cocktail bar. Why? Because there are impurities, and not only the salts, there are also the gases. So a fundamental step in uh, transparent gas is uh, to boil water and then to let it cool down. What happens, I could go on and uh, just uh, have a conference on boiling water, but at a certain point, water boils uh, and it decreases uh, with height. So if you go up to the top of the mountains, uh, uh, the temperature is lower. Basically, every 300 meters, uh, uh, water will boil at uh, one degree lower. And this is a piece of meat uh, that could be used uh, for a roast beef. And I talk about uh, the perfect roast beef. The temperature, as I was mentioning, is an essential parameter of cooking. Nearly everything uh, we eat, which has been cooked, we do eat raw things too, but most things uh, in all the civilization uh, or civilizations in the world are cooked. And controlling temperature is absolutely essential for a number of things, but above all uh, for the food stuff that contains protein. And there are certain temperatures uh, that have to be reached and others uh, that should not be exceeded. What can a scientist, a chemist, uh, look for when you observe cooking? I carried out an experiment uh, because science means theory, but also experimental science. Uh, so I took uh, seven uh, little cubes of meat to the left, you see, it is raw, and I cook them at uh, increasingly high temperatures. And uh, the last one is what I would call as tough as 
leather. Now, I'm going to try and explain why 55 is a degree centigrade is the best temperature. I want to show you what you have to look for. Here, you can see a change in color. These are chemical reactions. In particular, curl color is due to neoglobin, a protein that progressively changes, and from raw, it becomes pink and then gray brown. But there's also that in front of the first two cubes, I cook these these meat cubes in a saucepan with water in controlled temperature, and then I cut them in two because I was interested in the inside. Cutting them, you see these two still have the so-called juices of the meat, which we don't find with the others. What we also notice is the different consistency. Here, here you can see that it's still soft, it's not compressed, but progressively the fibers change and it, the meat is drier. Here you can see it. Here you can have the juices. So when I cut the meat, these juices were released. This is an in-between temperature. It's not very compressed, but there are no more juices. It's still sort of uh, soft, and if I chew this part, it's not dry, but it is not as juicy as the first. So meat uh, or muscle is about 20% protein and 75, 70% water, the rest are fats and carbohydrates. So raw meat, for example, 70, 75% is water, but we don't have water coming out while this experiment tells us uh, that if we cook uh, meat at these two temperatures, uh, then the water will be produced and we will feel it or perceive it in our mouths uh, as being softer and juicier, while the one to the further to the right will be soft but not releasing any juices uh, till we reach the ones that are very dry. These are the temperatures which I used. And you can see that at 60 degrees centigrade, which is the one that more or less is called the average one, and which I suggest is the maximum one if you want to cook steaks. There are, for example, the American steak houses where you don't ask uh, for a well-cooked steak. They'll throw you out. Uh, because steaks uh, cannot be cooked beyond or above 60. But if we want uh, juices, 50 to 55 are the temperatures uh, where you want a roast beef that is pink outside, soft uh, and juicy. So you will take that piece of meat, you put a thermometer. Thermometer is one of the best friends any chef can have. Here you can see you brown it on the outside because we want the it to be brown on the outside. The oven should be kept at 120, 130, and we get the inside, which is pink and juicy at that temperature with a crispy outside. The outside, we have it roasted if we use uh, we could also always uh, have another chemical reaction there because Master Chef mentioned a lot of people once they heard it uh, mentioned it and so they googled uh, uh, Maillard's reaction. Uh, this is uh, Louis Camille Maillard, and it is he studied uh, the fact uh, that. Um, 
He was working, in fact, on powder milk, um, and he wanted to know why it turned brown in the soldiers' rations. Uh, and this gives uh, the aroma of bread uh, and of meat, uh, a coat of fish. Uh, and this is due to a group of chemical reactions between some sugars uh, that are present, for example, ribose in, the, in meat, uh, and uh, the residues of proteins. This is a reaction that we do, and uh, previously there were some we spoke about temperature, while well, now we're going to talk about chemistry. The, we can add substances. This is another experiment uh, where we take potatoes and we boil them in water. As you will observe, there are four cubes. Uh, the ones to the left is uh, the raw potato, while to the right uh, it's uh, the cooked, boiled potato. But I've added two things. In the first case, uh, the potato has uh, very clear-cut edges, while in the second one this is not so. This is the effect uh, due to the pH of water in particular. I exaggerated, uh, so in the, the first, uh, I added acetic acid, which basically means vinegar. Here, this is molecule, and below, instead of acid pH, I used an alkaline or basic um, substance, uh, bicarbonate, which is not necessary because in many places in Italy, the pH is 8. Uh, uh, so you don't have to add bicarbonate, but you may, if you're used to cooking potatoes, it depends on the type of cooking, the variety of potatoes, the type, but other factors, but all the rest being the same, this is the difference that you have between acid and alkaline water. This can be used because, say, for instance, I want a potato salad, I want to have potatoes that are uh, cooked, uh, but uh, very sharp edges to them. In that case, um, I have uh, a chemical reaction. While well, this one, uh, I may wish uh, uh, to have partly, I have to be careful not to cook too much or to add too much bicarbonate, but I want them to be softer in the middle. For example, I use it to, to what I call my scientific potatoes. Everybody has a different ways. Uh, I did it on Instagram, uh, we were mentioning before Christmas, uh, mm, did anyone cook my potatoes? Yes, I see a few people have raised their hand. So you can obtain potatoes here uh, that, uh, that are soft inside because we pre-cook them not too long and crispy in the outside. So I added a bit of bicarbonate um, so as uh, to cook and make uh, the inner part of the potatoes, uh, which is much uh, softer, pretty ugly. My friend, a photographer, was saying, I won't take a photograph because uh, they're ugly. And we had to argue a bit about it. I was saying, and I don't care that it was beautiful. They must be uh, ex explanatory. That's all it is. Uh, when you take these potatoes, uh, you must be careful not to mix them because otherwise it would be mashed potatoes, uh, adding a bit of olive oil, and then I put it in an oven at very high temperature, so all that starch which is attached to it becomes uh, uh, this uh, wonderful crust. Uh, Instagram, I then had messages, these are uh, are the best oven potatoes I've ever tried. So it's something very simple, and the message that you have on the whole is to add acid not only to potatoes, uh, but to any uh, pulses or, we, for example, beans or whatever. We add acids directly, or we add uh, tomato, which is acid. Uh, then they remain hard for hours while if, and this is an old trick uh, that had been discovered, if we add bicarbonate or we leave them uh, to soak in bicarbonate, uh, then they become much softer. Uh, this is also true for chickpeas. Uh, it's something that you can do for other things. Uh, then there is some chemical reactions uh, 
uh, that uh, are not uh, entirely under our control. We don't have to add anything. Many chemical reactions uh, are triggered by the allium family, that is to say, leeks, uh, um, chives, uh, uh, onions. There are molecules that contain sulfur. Some of these, uh, uh, these reactions are triggered uh, by enzymes. For example, this is uh, for garlic, uh, and it's a color which I decided I wanted to obtain it is a traditional Chinese recipe where they use this trick that you take some garlic, in, put it in a the fridge, then make holes with a toothpick and put in vinegar and it becomes blue. When some of you may have done it by mistake, preparing something, especially if you mix it with uh, onion or other things, and you see that it changes uh, color. It's not a problem you should, you should worry about. It's just a chemical reaction. Chemistry of garlic is something you should know if you wish to use it, because uh, people, some people like it and some people don't. Some people cook it, some people don't. Uh, there are some uh, that uh, sell you how to treat it. And some, for example, they say to press uh, uh, garlic, um, or in some cases uh, slice it or put it in a hole in a sort of frying pan. Or I sometimes use an, a garlic uh, press. All uh, this is essential because indirectly we're controlling this uh, chemical reaction with this enzyme, which is alinase with two eyes. It's not a print of typo, it's alinase with two eyes. And uh, raw, whole garlic doesn't taste of garlic, just like whole raw onion doesn't taste of onion really just just a whiff of it, uh, but the strong aromas develop uh, when we cut it, and the same thing happens with garlic. Why? Well, because garlic contains a number of sulfur molecules, uh, which is absorbed from the soil, and it contains a molecule that is called alin, and that has uh, no smell. But when we cut the garlic, or we press it, or we damage it, we release an enzyme, which is a protein which links or is linked to chemical or causes chemical reactions and transforms it uh, through a series of very rapid chemical uh, reactions into molecules uh, that uh, are, have the very strong aroma. Nature did not develop this mechanism so that we could use uh, garlic in the Piedmontese dish Bagna Cauda, but it's because it's a chemical warfare against uh, um, parasites. Uh, if there's a rodent that goes there, animals can run away from predators, uh, plants can't, and so this animal will have immediately these uh, full of molecules uh, that are acrid, or they bothersome, uh, and so might think about it next time. Some of these substances, they're natural pesticides. Uh, uh, they are the flavors we've uh, grown to love. How can we use this knowledge? There are some recipes uh, that say that you have to cook garlic before you press it, to cook it whole, in milk, for example, but also in water. Or alternatively, this is a recipe which is in the book, uh, I toast uh, the garlic directly in a f pan frying pan. Why does this alter the chemistry now? Let us see how this can be done. Why we can also put it whole in the microwave, because alinase uh, reacts to heat and therefore it can be easily destroyed if we heat it uh, be above a certain temperature. So when we put a whole a uh, piece of garlic uh, in boiling water and we leave it there, then the enzyme is completely destroyed at that temperature. So when we will cut uh, subsequently or crush the garlic, uh, there is no more enzyme, no enzyme that will transform the alin um, and give the 
characteristic smell. They do have some smell, but it's a different one. And this way, it's sort of sweet uh, because it also contains sugars. Uh, and there are some recipes uh, that use uh, an enormous amount of garlic. Uh, if it were used uh, raw, but treated like this, uh, and you then spread it as if it were sweet cream. So the knowledge of this enzymes uh, can be used uh, to decide what type of intensity you want the garlic to have. So if I take a recipe and I crush it in a garlic press, uh, at that point, I have maximum release of those enzymes. Parlando di enzimi, gli enzimi sono Talking about enzymes, enzymes act in very many other cases. One of the cases where they act is tomato. Tomatoes have a very complex chemistry, but the aroma of a fresh tomato is, it takes place, so it releases when you cut it. A tomato, a whole tomato, raw one, has, smells the tomato, but not really, but the, you only have the smell when you cut it. It doesn't last, it doesn't linger for a long time. So if you're preparing a caprese, that is to say a tomato and mozzarella salad, there is an enzyme that acts on the unsaturated acid, which are present in the tomato, and they will transform these into aromas which we associate to fresh tomatoes. If in the bar where gave you the uh, gray roast beef. They also prepared the caprese at 8 in the morning, and you eat it at 12, uh, certainly they won't taste of tomatoes. There are scientists that study how you can preserve vegetables, and if I take a tomato, a ripe one, taken right off uh, the, in the, from the garden, from the green garden, or I was given it, and I put it in the fridge, and it stays there for more than two days, maximum three. After three days, uh, the enzyme is completely destroyed. So even if I take it out of the fridge and I cut it, uh, and I bring it back to room temperature, because uh, it's not a good idea to eat a frozen tomato, there is no flavor. So very often we say, ah, oh, vegetables, uh, they had a different flavor, apples, uh, and so on, and we give genetic changes or industrialization true. It is true that a lot of modern apple varieties have been developed to answer the market. For example, we make choices when we buy things at the supermarket. For example, apples are less sweet smelling now than the apples that they were at the beginning of the 20th century. Why? Because genetic uh, improvement and market uh, have required the crisper apples, um, uh, the s same of the, uh, that you have with denture advertising. I like the flaky ones, but you don't get them. And so just having more crispier and crispier apples, the aroma, sometimes it's a random thing, uh, has uh, been lost. While with tomatoes, the problem is ours. How many of you, when you buy tomatoes, maybe in the summer, and so you've bought them from a farmer, or, and you know that they've never been put in a fridge. You take them home, and instead of keeping them in the room temperature and eating them um, immediately, you put them in the fridge. And if you take them in the fridge, and you take them out of the fridge uh, one day, two days, three days after, uh, it's our fault if they don't taste of anything, because sometimes we don't know where and what to put in the fridge. If you're lucky enough to have very ripe and light aromatic tomatoes, take them and eat them immediately. At the most, you can keep them for one day. Scientific research experiments uh, that have been carried out uh, both in labs uh, but also with tasters because not everything can be done in a lab, but in some cases the human aspect is necessary, the per human who uh, tastes them. Talking about uh, talking about acids, and I spoke about unsaturated uh, um, 
facts that you have, I'm sure you've heard people talk about uh, uh, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, unsaturated uh, fats. I mentioned some. Uh, which um, were in present, present in um, tomatoes, like linoleic acid, uh, which contributes to the aroma. Oil is uh, a liquid uh, fat. Uh, the, the, the temperature might vary from uh, whether you're up in the mountain or in Tanzania, or if you're up at Courmayeur near the Mont Blanc, but it, uh, whatever it is. If you have, you see a label here, you see that you that also lists uh, the distinction between uh, and 100 milliliters you have 92 of uh, uh, fat there's nothing else uh, 11 uh, saturated 26 uh, monounsaturated uh, oleic acid usually in 55 grams uh, as polyunsaturated this is a table from the book uh, where i have listed uh, some uh, normal oils that we use you see the first one gives us a saturated, uh, then uh, monounsaturated in linoleic acid usually, and then polyunsaturated. You see it's a uh, two, then uh, 90, here we have 92, sorry, uh, for uh, coconut oil and so on and so forth. Uh, for a chemist, oil, and not even for a chef, oils are the same. Co from the point of view of calories, they're the same. There are, there's no oil, one gram of oil, whatever oil has uh, the same number of calories, uh, but the component of, of saturated, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated oils uh, can influence or should influence the way in which we use them. For instance, in pastry, nearly always you have to use uh, saturated uh, fatty acids, uh, butter or whatever, marge or lard or whatever you're going to use or cocoa butter, because it has to be solid or virtually solid at uh, the room temperature to do a series of things. If, uh, I don't know if you try to have pastry with uh, uh, maize or corn oil, um, it might be very good, but the structure is technically and physically different. Uh, there is a reason if you have to use uh, saturated uh, uh, fats or uh, fatty acids to do things. Uh, here you see polyunsaturated ones here. These should not be used to fry because uh, they degrade very rapidly. So unless it is uh, uh, the uh, sunflower oil. But you can use them for mayonnaises. Here I have no time to talk about tomato sauce. I will just say something in the book. Uh, there is a whole chapter of uh, a recipe for all the ones, because each one of us uh, will be cooking their sauce in a different way. I'm sure that you've tasted them at a restaurant or at a friend's house, are very different. Why? Well, because in the course of preparing this, uh, there are very many in between steps uh, uh, that determine the final uh, te flavor according to the type of, uh, for example, what you use to brown garlic, no garlic, onion, the temperature at which you add the uh, oil, the garlic, the onion will determine what it can produce. So for example, if we grate uh, uh, onion with uh, a very, with a grater, or if we cut it, uh, the molecules will be different. Uh, enzymes, the enzymes that we're mentioning uh, also act here, so it's not the same thing if you use olive oil as we all do in Italy, or a seed oil which has uh, more polyunsaturated fatty acids, uh, or on the other hand, use, uh, using butter, for instance. So there are very many choices, uh, crossroads uh, that exist uh, when preparing a tomato sauce. Uh, so following the book um, and uh, following the various steps, if you go to see all the various combinations, uh, you will obtain tens of thousands of uh, different tomato sauces. There isn't one which is the best. Uh, according to the flavor, you will choose one or the other. But I suggest that you should try a different uh, uh, solution just to, this is why I gave the rather uh, odd name, because uh, c the number of objects that I can be obtained with the same ingredients, and here again, 
I'm just saying that this is yet another thing that surprised people when I wrote uh, uh, a book about pastry because uh, I wrote uh, a book uh, um, with a chapter called Air and Other Gases uh, and putting air as an ingredient. Uh, we use eggs, uh, for example, we use flour. But the last chapter is due to an ingredient which is essential, but is normally not discussed. Uh, it's not openly discussed because we don't add it, uh, weighing it. Uh, it's air, air, or in any case, gases. Uh, and for sure, clearly, when we add, uh, say, yeast uh, or chemical uh, yeast that develops uh, CO2, that's an important gas, but we use uh, gases, uh, for instance, uh, for meringues uh, or whipped cream in meringues. Uh, uh, why do we whisk it, uh, whisk the white of the egg, and then we add things uh, for a souffle or a tiramisu? It's one way to add lightness, that is to say gas, to a product. The same thing happens. Uh, uh, when uh, we whip cream and we use a whisk, uh, we're englobing gases. Uh, in this case, it's air. In the case of yeast, uh, uh, it could be something else. Uh, it can be carbon mon um, CO2, but um, there are various gases. Uh, we're not going to talk about this. Uh, and we also use um, ammonia. It's called uh, ammonia for cakes. It's a carbonate uh, that uh, breaks down and produces ammonia. It's used, uh, for example, for crackers or grissini. So gases uh, are an essential component that we use. Uh, sometimes it's simply air. When we whisk uh, the white of the eggs, never put salt because it will destabilize it. And sometimes you use the, because it is in the traditional recipes, it says uh, use the salt. But uh, if you use a bit of lemon, uh, then the meringues will be much better. I will take uh, now the meringues uh, to start on my last subject to show you how a chemical and scientific view of cooking uh, can help you invent different things. New recipes. It is something I developed the name gastronomic reductionism. I hope there are no philosophers uh, present uh, who will insult me, but reductionism it means uh, that you see an ob object or a phenomenon as if it were some of the parts uh, so that I could explain a complicated ph phenomenon merely if I, by dividing it in its ingredients. In science, it works very well. Most science is a reductionist uh, study. Outside science, the term is used more in a more derogatory manner. But what does it mean? What does it mean in cooking? I don't look only the ingredients of the recipe, but I try to understand what they do, the functional way. So I can take it and break it down in its functional parts, what does what, and I can then make it together with ingredients that appear to be different, which are different, but do things that are functionally similar. For example, meringues. Meringues. French meringues uh, is uh, white of the egg plus sugar, then cooked in the oven. In terms of a chemist, uh, we what is white uh, uh, of the egg is a 10% protein and 90% water. These proteins must denature and they must englobe air. And I do this by whisking it uh, by hand or with a the machine. Then I add sugar because that will crystallize, uh, because at one point uh, the water evaporates. Uh, and if I didn't use sugar, it would be like a little tiny omelet. So it's basic uh, for these uh, proteins uh, should be transformed, in this case, um, by the mechanical action. And there must be no fats. You know that if uh, you have uh, 
um, if you carry, if you if the yoke goes in, you can't make it. But I can do something different. So my question is, can I produce a similar meringue but using different ingredients, but using things that make that have the same reaction? So at one point, when I thought about it, I think uh, that one things I see that when I ha- produces a cream is the cappuccino cream because the cappuccino bubbles it's exactly like when I whisk uh, uh, the whites of the egg so the question I ask myself is can I produce a sort of milk meringue and at this point uh, a scientist uh, thinks about it uh, I can't just take the recipe and transform it and use uh, uh, milk instead of whites, I won't get a result because the proteins are different and uh, if you whisk milk, uh, you can't do anything so much so with a cappuccino and this uh, is the key observation, must be heated and when it reaches a certain temperature, then you can have the froth, which is the equivalent, but you mustn't have any fat, this is the other essential thing. So you have to you can, well, work uh, uh, with uh, whole milk, uh, because I don't want fat, so I will be using skimmed milk. Uh, you look at the label, it's skimmed, it's virtually zero, there's a little bit of fat, but very little, so I have to modify to the proteins to do something with which is the equivalent of whisking which doesn't work with milk so I must heat it so going to see scientific articles I discovered that uh, the milk proteins uh, require 885 degrees uh, centigrade to transform and I did this in my home Uh, lab here, I have a thermometer in it. I heated it uh, for a few minutes, 85, then I degrees centigrade, uh, then I whisked it. Uh, I had to, to get the froth. I had to, I tried uh, with the amount of sugar, you need much less uh, than in traditional meringues because there's already lactose, which is a sugar in milk. So a series of attempts, uh, and you'll find all the details in my book. And I then have a froth, which is very delicate. Uh, This is still raw, so it's not as crispy and hard as the other, but uh, I manage uh, to, I then put it in the oven. And these are the cooked meringues, call them meringues. I call them milk clouds. Uh, But uh, you see here, I can show you that they're cooked. uh, And the taste, uh, I did it once. I had a conference uh, and someone had prepared these sort of uh, meringues. Uh, They taste of what we used to call galatine, the milk uh, um, sweets, uh, milk-based sweets. So this is an example of how a scientific chemical version of a food can uh, make it possible to invent things that are different uh, because this is not a recipe, this is something which maybe a chef will make and will build a recipe around it. But a chemical vision of uh, cooking is very useful, and in some cases, especially in the more cutting-edge chefs uh, who are doing something different, they also do it, maybe sometimes they're doing it because of intuition or by chance. Uh, You might say, And this is something that is done very often in the food processing industry. Why have I got to merely use uh, animal proteins? I could also use uh, plant proteins. And for example, you can use uh, the water of uh, the chickpeas. Uh, uh, This is also true for beans, but the chickpeas give the best flavor. And uh, meringues uh, with chickpeas are used by vegans uh, who don't want to use uh, milk or the white of an egg. It's something which the uh, food processing industry developed about 20 years ago, but uh, they were never used uh, traditionally. I would say that with this, uh, what time is it? I think we would leave time to questions at this point here. Eccoli. Ah, sì. Una domanda uh, per Dario. Nella a question 
that in Barry's version, they suggest that you should put onions in the fridge before you cut them um, so you don't cry. There are tens of ideas. Most of them don't work. There are scientific articles where they took volunteers. You could keep a candle, eat parsley, a series of things. The mechanism, the chemical mechanism of, is that when we cut onions, there's a release of that enzyme, which in the case of garlic is pungent but doesn't make us cry. But in the um, onions, uh, there are volatile components, acids, uh, that uh, then ha have an irritated, uh, irritating effect. Uh, tearing, it's called. Uh, having said this, uh, what can work and what can't? Enzymes uh, cause chemical reactions. Enzymes are slowed down by cold. So if I take an onion that was in room temperature, the enzyme will work uh, more, or an onion that was held for half an hour in the freezer. You can't get it to, to freeze, but it should be very, very cold. But that only slows it down. So if I only work, cut, were to cut one onion, it works. But if I've got to cut lots of onions, in the end, the only device that works is to wear a pair of glasses, like swimming glasses. There's a photo on the internet, but it is true. I use glasses, swimming glasses, because when you cut one onion, uh, anything can work. But if you cut five or six, and not only, but you will also fill the atmosphere of the kitchen, and so anyone coming in, but you can go on with your swimming glasses. Another thing that partly works uh, is that these uh, substances uh, are volatile, so they go to the air. But if you cut an onion, and you cut it in two, and then you can wet the chopping board with water and then keep them until they've been cut. You turn them upside down on the chopping board so that at least uh, they will stop the substance. But the only thing is uh, you could wear a um, mask or two. Here there's a question. You defend yourself from chemistry with physics. Thank you. I imagine that from the chemical point of view, the material that you use for cooking is important. So my question is, what is it best to use as material? Is it uh, uh, steel, aluminium, non-stick, uh, taking into consideration the chemical reactions that take place? The answer is that there is no best material because it depends what you want to do. It is something which I discussed in my book because there are some reactions uh, that are facilitated, uh, for example, by metals. Uh, for example, Maillard's reaction, if I want to have a steak which is uh, not burnt but uh, roasted, uh, it is best to use uh, not a non-stick one, but to use, uh, for instance, uh, a cast iron one, because uh, the, in this case, uh, the uh, iron will catalyze uh, this reaction, do it uh, uh, with uh, chicken breast, which you, where you can see it, uh, because uh, it isn't like beef. Uh, if you do it, uh, try to use an anti non-stick and then a uh, cast iron or then a stone one. You see that uh, in the metal one, uh, it develops more. But in other cases, uh, it might be necessary to maintain heat for longer. In that case, uh, for example, ceramic. In other cases, again, it is best to avoid using in some things, and I wrote recently, and I prepared a video on it. Um, if I have some things that are particularly acid, fish or tomato, it's best not to use aluminum, because aluminum partly is, uh, unless it is covered, uh, coated, it, it, it reacts. And not only is it not best to use it because of the acid, uh, 
but also if uh, we whisk in an aluminium, say, uh, the whites of an egg, it goes gray because the aluminium interacts uh, with protein. So the answer is uh, there is not one best, but clearly then uh, the level of uh, thermal conduction Aluminium, not so good. Certainly you can't cook. I haven't got silver uh, saucepans, which would be ideal, or golden ones. So copper is a good solution, uh, but uh, it's also toxic, so I have to coat it. So according to what I do, I should have different uh, ones. And then if you get Maillard's reaction, you will, uh, it'll be thick. Uh, this too will be cut. It is true, for example, for eggs, uh, I use a non-stick uh, um, for omelets because uh, eggs on metal, they attack immediately. Another question here. I don't know how many. Sí, buonasera, professore. Good evening, Una professor about 10 friends of mine, and I'm the first signatory, asked me to ask the following question. Will you write on fish and shellfish? Several people have asked, not soon. I won't be writing any book. Uh, this year, I'm not going to write. Uh, I, had a, I spent my summer holidays writing because I had to give the book uh, at the end of June. I was long because I had to, at the same time, organize two courses at university. I spent July and August uh, in cooking and writing. So I'm exhausted from this point of view. The book, and I don't know when I'll do it, but the next book will not be on fish, but will be on pulses uh, and uh, grains, uh, the ones that contain a lot of starch. There's a lot to be said on rice pasta, um, on pulses. We associated them with uh, pulses, with proteins, but in fact, they're mostly starch. So there's a lot to be said. And on fish, a lot of people ask me, but they tell me, and also from the publishers, that uh, books on fish don't sell. And there's a reason. Because to cook fish, uh, fish, uh, fish costs a lot. It's difficult. It's expensive. But how many of you know how to cook? Uh, right, tuna fish is all right. Your swordfish is very easy. But uh, I don't know. You take a more complicated fish, uh, monkfish, for instance. Uh, so most people, me included, apart from the very easy thing, I prefer to spend my money in a restaurant. I go to a restaurant, and then I know that there they know how to cook the fish. So except for places where there is a traditional coastline place, places in Italy, in inland, uh, there is no tradition not even of recognizing the different fish. If I go to a supermarket, sometimes I don't really recognize. I don't know how to cook them. And so I'm told that most Italians are like that. So possibly they might say, write a book on fish, but I can't uh, write one uh, one book simply on trouts and, and shrimps, which are the only ones I know how to. Well, on trouts, I could write half a book uh, because, um, and a few others, uh, uh, but um, rainbow trouts too, but uh, 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 writing a book on fish, other than the fact that it would be very complicated, that they're very different, but that they wouldn't sell a lot. But who knows? Uh, maybe in four or five years, uh, the people who follow me are enough and uh, numerous enough uh, for me to think of writing a book uh, on fish. Uh, they say that you should be a bit drier in your answers, shorter, so to speak, because there are lots of questions. There's one up there. I'm a chemist, uh, but for me, beignets or cream puffs are magic. Uh, and I would like to know that with the same recipe, the same procedures, the same temperatures, three times uh, they're, su they're successful and three times uh, they are disasters. Uh, flour, flour, because flour, the sugar's always the same, the yolk, but flour may vary. They have a different type uh, or a different amount of gluten. Uh, beignet or cream puff is difficult. In this case, uh, there's also not only temperature, but timing and schedule and temperature of the oven. It must 
swell. It must it inside it must be empty and it must not go flat, which means that when it swells, the gas that uh, is released inside, uh, which is steam, because it's the steam of the water that makes it swell. So it must do this must happen very quickly, but it must not escape. This means that the structure of the pastry must be such uh, that it maintains uh, the gas as far as possible, and this happens if you use a strong uh, flour. By strong, I mean with a high percentage of gluten. If you have a zero-zero flour, only it indicates the degree of purification. It doesn't tell us how much gluten, because a zero-zero, for, for example, is very poor in gluten. It has 9% of uh, protein. Uh, but if I want to use, if I want bread, I must use zero zero. Now it is now not accepted. But now I f don't find it. I find all sorts of flowers, but not normal one. But I have to use flour, uh, which is strong, which maybe has 12, 13 percent protein, and so a lot of gluten. So sometimes, uh, if you follow a recipe, and most of the recipes for pastry, except for cakes, so where you buy flour for cakes, uh, when you need a particular st gluten strength uh, for a long levitation or, I don't know, baba rum, rum baba, or something like that, you need uh, the structure of the flour to be quite strong. And then there's a matter of temperatures. There must be a temperature which is very, very high in the oven, not too much, but you must be close to burning it because uh, while it expands, uh, it must uh, the outside must cook and they must coagulate uh, so that it is. Uh, so it's, I would believe that it's nearly always the flour. Be brief and to the point. I would like to ask a question on the last slide. A meringues with milk. I would like to know if before putting them in the oven, the foam, how long do, will it last? Five minutes, no more. Imagine the cappuccino froth. You like a siphon? Yes, but there's a different gas in the siphon. Very, very delicate. But the oven, a classical mistake. I'm sure that a lot of the chefs don't do it. Most chefs don't do it. Uh, but uh, you do at home. You put it in the oven when the temperature is the right temperature, not before and not after. So if I, I put it in the oven, and inside, because they must uh, crystallize the outside part very rapidly so that it maintains the structure, because sugar, the outside sugar, like meringues, maintains the structure. There's a question up there. First of all, I wanted to thank you, because thanks to your book on pastry, I can explain pastry to my students. And then I wanted to ask you from a chemical point of view, vegetable or fruit that have ripened on the plant compared to fruit or vegetable that are gathered when they're unripe and then put in the fridge or uh, markets uh, in the storehouse, Is it, are they different? The answer is complicated. There's an entire chapter of the book devoted to this. The answer, as often happens in science, it depends. It depends. There are some fruits that once they have, uh, I'm talking about it because tomatoes, uh, eggplants, uh, or aubergines are all different, but they're, they're also fruit. There are some fruits that once uh, picked uh, will never improve their taste or aroma. There's no hope. So if you pick, uh, Ch uh, strawberries, when they're white uh, or green, they will remain like that, or grapes. Uh, it has to be picked or harvested at the right moment. It's called, there's a difference between climateric and non-climateric fruit according to what they do after they pick. So a fruit is part of the ones that don't ripen, don't improve, there's no hope. Others can 
I'm not saying being equivalent to the ones that have been picked at the right moment, because that would be what you should do, but unfortunately we can't do it. So a tomato that is picked from the plant when it is ripe is certainly better than the one which is picked when it's green, because it is already uh, between green and pink, say. But tomatoes, like apples, uh, can continue to ripen, even triggered by ethylene in our houses or other places. This, however, influences uh, the consistency. It becomes a bit softer. The color changes in the tomato. It becomes the old. Uh, you, if you, for example, you take an apple and uh, a an, uh, tomato which is green together and put them in a bag, it becomes red because it, there's a release of ethylene. Aromas do not improve because if they haven't been developed up to that moment, uh, sweetness changes because apples uh, can be treated in that way, so they're picked uh, sometimes early. And in the time which they spend, in the warehouse, so they can transform, continue to transform um, starch into sugar. But after a while, they, they, since they continue, they, co they use uh, their sugar. So at one point, they become a bit tasteless. Apples uh, eaten now are better than the ones uh, that are eaten, I don't know, in March or April. So the difference is this. Then there are lemons, for instance. Uh, but all citrus fruit, once they've been picked, uh, will not improve acidity or sugar. The only thing that they do, and this time is misleading, that they may transform from green to yellow. That is to say, chlorophyll disappears. But when you've picked a lemon that is green and you keep it yellow close to an apple or a tomato, it becomes yellow, but it hasn't. it isn't sweeter. It's exactly the same as it was. Uh, because citrus fruit, once they've been picked, they don't improve. Peppers, bell peppers, they don't improve. In fact, uh, they start become soft. Uh, there's one particular case, that is avocado, which will ripen only after it has been picked. Uh, and on the plant, uh, it remains as it is. Pineapple is another one that once it has been picked, uh, it, will n it stays as is. Uh, it will not improve. And there are others. It's full of fruit. We only have two more questions. Good evening. I would like to ask what is the difference uh, between gelling and densifying substances? Well, the word says it. Gelifying substances generate gels. The structure that is semi-solid and the trapples inside water. So I take uh, white of the egg and I heat it. I heat it. At that point, it becomes white and it traps within water. That's a gel. Normally, it's for gelatines, but uh, aspic or whatever. So gel is a protein you could also do it with agar. It's a semi-solid structure. I can take it and eat it. While densifiers do that, that is to say starch, or um, if we want to add cornstarch uh, or something that we add to chocolate or anything is viscous, they don't gel. They simply make the substance more viscous, uh, but they don't make it semi-solid. They're not able to trap water. So when we add it, uh, a bit of starch or what a corn starch or whatever, or potato starch, it's to give a different texture as the same sort of things that you do with bechamel or white sauce. Uh, you add uh, starch, uh, which ha uh, can make it denser, but not gelify. Last question. I study chemistry near here, and I would like to ask uh, when I want to fry or brown something, how should I treat the subject? Should I put the ingredients in the cold? Uh, oil and then heat everything or heat the oil and then put things inside. 
that browning and frying are different things. If I brown it, the temperature usually does not exceed 100 degrees. And I put a lot of onion in very little oil. There is more onion than oil, so there's a lot of water in vegetables, 70, 80, 90 percent. So until water has evaporated, there's not a lot of oil and it doesn't exceed. So in this case, uh, the effect is different, and it's one of those uh, uh, combination therapies for the tomato ones. Uh, if you have the results are different, different flavors, but both are acceptable. But why, if you're frying, not browning, you have a lot of oil temp that must reach a very high temperature, 170, 180. European Union is asking to bring it down to 170 because of the production of substances, uh, but very high. And you have to have a lot of oil because when I add the product that is to fry, the temperature must not drop too much. In fact, the classical mistake at home is uh, that we're cheap and we can don't use enough oil. If I use very little oil and then put octopus in it or whatever to fry it, the temperature drops with the potatoes. What happens is that the oil is too cold, so it doesn't instantaneously vaporize uh, the water in it, and therefore, if we have 180 degrees and we put the potato into fry, you see that immediately there's a sort of foam and the steam that uh, exits uh, the potato. What it does is if the temperature is very high, it cooks and therefore there's a very high pressure and avoids the oil entering too much in the substance. So if you fry at a constant temperature, has gives us a product uh, which is uh, has less is less oily than frying at lower temperature because uh, the steam exits slow more slowly and so the oil enters so more, more quickly so use a thermometer use a lot of oil and cook things a little at a time don't throw everything inside but uh, because the oil must be very high temperature. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dario Bresanini. Thank you, Piero Bianucci. Thank you all of you. See you next week.